So, um, thank you, uh, Seema, for your, for your first presentation. I fully agree with you that um, materials are not um, the problem. I think the problem, I think the circular economy is a design challenge. I think it's the way we use our materials, the way we look at our materials, the way we interact with our materials. Um, that's basically what's causing the issue. Now, I am aware that is very close to sort of the, uh, the, the, the gun reform and guns don't kill people kind of argument. Um, so bear with me um, where I'm going with this. Um, my name is Jan. I am a uh, designer. I am a public speaker um, and I work mainly on circular economy and social innovation. And as uh, Martin said, I um, occasionally start companies. Um, I find it very interesting to um, use activism as a compass and use entrepreneurship as my guide in how to amplify impact and how to uh, grow impact. I am one of the co-founders of Switchers. Switchers is a, a circular strategic innovation agency. We help companies in translating their sustainability ambitions into actions. Um, so what we do is we build sustainable strategies with them. We look at new opportunities in terms of products, services, um, ways to build their model. And then occasionally with Switchers, we also um, launch our own startups or help SMEs and startups to launch their ideas. Uh, we've worked together with several, um, several companies um, Port of Antwerp, European Commission, uh, universities, um, project developers, all kinds of um, projects. What we do is we design innovation tools, templates, methodologies for people to use design thinking and innovation as a catalyst to bring circular economy and sustainability into action. Most of our tools we try to open source as much as possible. Um, you can always have a look at diy.switchers.com where you can find most of our tools uh, for free to download and to use yourself if you want to. Um, occasionally we work on reports. Um, I actually met Martin for the first time working on the Circular Economy for Plastics report of the European Commission a couple of years ago. Um, and more recently we contributed to um, the Elmer Carter Foundation report on financing the circular economy, uh, looking at it from a business model point of view. And we occasionally uh, found or co-found new, uh, new companies working on sustainability in different ways. Um, the way I like to start my presentations uh, most of the time is uh, with a questionnaire. So um, I've got some questions ready for you just to warm you up on why I think circular economy is uh, relevant. So you should see a poll popping up normally if all goes well. And the first question is, if we're looking at the uh, Great Pacific garbage patch. Um, how big, I mean, I'm, I know we're talking with uh, a lot of um, scientists here, so I thought I would use a very useful uh, way to, to measure surfaces of something. So I used Spain. Um, how much Spain is the Great Pacific garbage patch, do you think? Is it one time Spain? Do we have two times Spain floating around in the ocean or three times Spain floating around in the ocean as um, mostly plastic garbage. So um, I can't really see who's voting, so I'm just taking another second here to let people uh, cast their vote and then we'll go to the, um, the solution. The solution is three times Spain. So that means that um, there's uh, a floating island that is three times the size of Spain floating around in the Great Pacific Ocean. Um, about 50% of you had that correct. Um, so that is uh, 1.6 million square kilometers um, was calculated is the size of this, of this patch. Um, the second question, how many barrels of oil do we uh, consume on a day? A barrel of oil is about 160 liters of oil. Is that 1 million barrels each day? Is it 10 million barrels each day? Or do we consume 100 barrels of oil each day? Oil is an extremely important component or a material used for plastic, but also, also for energy uh, and mostly mobility. Um, again, cast your vote. What do you think? And um, 
I will show you the answer in a bit. The answer is uh, 100 million. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if you knew that. Um, well, 40% of you did uh, know that. And uh, most of you thought it was 10 million. Um, and that is an astounding number. If you look at it on a year base, that basically means that we use uh, 36.5 billion barrels of oil each year. Now, if we look at our consumption behavior, um, it's going up. But if we would assume that it stays the way it is right now and would look at the reserves that we know of right now, the amount of barrels of oil that are still left in the, in the earth, how many barrels do you think we still have um, as we speak, uh, according to the, the, the studies? Do we have about 800 billion barrels of oil left, about uh, 1,700 billion or 3,400 billion barrels of oil left um, to drill up and to use. I'm going to wait a bit until you can cast your votes. All right, so the answer is we've got uh, 1,700 billion barrels of oil left. So 37% of you had that correct. Um, but that means if we look at our consumption today and we would assume that it uh, remains the same, uh, which it doesn't, um, that would mean that we have about uh, 47.5 years, 50 years left of oil in our, um, in our planet. So circular economy. Circular economy in a nutshell is an economic system aimed at minimizing waste and keeping materials in the loop as long as possible and as high end as possible. The Alma Carter Foundation is probably the leading organization working on this and they built this model. Um, and when I show this to people the first time I'm talking about circular economy, um, this is the main reaction I get. Um, so I'm going to break it down for you a bit. Is, um, this is a, a graph made by Circular Flanders. Um, basically, the linear economy is a take make waste economic system. We extract materials, uh, mostly non renewable materials. We extract them, we use them in a product, and at a certain point, this product becomes waste, and then we have to deal with it in some way. Um, in a recycling economy, what you do is you try to use the material again, maybe two or three times in a different component, uh, most of the time downcycling, and in the end, it will become waste. And in the circular economy, what we're aiming at is trying to keep these loops as close as possible. Um, so this means um, recycling, upcycling instead of downcycling. Um, so if you look at it from a uh, value chain point of view is you have virgin materials that we extract or we create. Uh, we put them in a production process, we bring them to distribution, to the use phase, and at the end of life um, there's a waste stream valorization moment and maybe in the end a, uh, a dump or incineration. Incineration, uh, as said before, can be very interesting in terms of um, getting extra energy out of it, but from a materials point of view, from a design point of view, it's the end of the exercise for your material. So where we're at right now um, is in a linear economy, going from the left side from the virgin materials to dump or burn or um, dispose. Um, and what we're trying to do with the circular economy, and that's an important one, is we try to close the loops in various ways. It's not just about end of life and then giving it a new life. It's also about extending the life of products. It's also about having several uses for the same product so that you can use your materials more effectively. It's about um, closing loops on a centralized or on a decentralized level. So there's various strategies on which you can make the circular economy work. And one of the examples that I uh, often use is the example of a shoe. Um, shoes are most of the times created out of uh, various polymers, various materials, all glued or sewn together um, to become the shoe. Now, what happens with shoes, um, if we look, for example, at the soles of a shoe, is uh, most of the time it's made out of oil, it's rubber. Uh, we bring that to the shoe, we sew it on or we glue it on, um, brought to a retailer, we uh, sell it to people, people use them after the time uh, your shoe gets worn out and then you um, dispose of it. And most of the time it gets burned after that. Um, if you're lucky, it becomes a running track for the next couple of years, but after a while it will become waste. Um, 
So one of the ways you can look at circular economy is rethinking materials, upcycling waste streams. So this is a startup from Amsterdam um, and they had these sort of little waste bins for gum, for chewing gum. And they said, well, we can actually make, um, we can make shoes, we can make soles out of rubber gum. So um, chewing gum. So what they did is they started collecting a waste stream that was at this point um, a cost for the city and they turned it into a, um, a valuable product that they then could reuse again. Um, so what you do there is you go to your uh, waste pile and you look for materials that you can reuse in a different way and actually use them as a addition to the um, existing model, the existing value chain. Um, another example is um, uh, styrofoam, the, the different packaging materials that we use just to keep products in place in the box that we shaped a bit too big for our products. Um, again, a lot of them are non-renewable materials that we use basically just as packaging. They have no real function rather than protecting the product until it gets used. And you can't do much with it afterwards. Um, so one of the materials that I really like that I'm very enthusiastic about are bio-based materials like mycelium. Mycelium is a uh, mushroom material. It's the, the root structure of, uh, of mushrooms. And what you can do if you, you can use agricultural waste and then add that um, to mycelium and let basically let it grow specific shapes, let it grow in specific forms and use that as insulation, packaging, uh, whatever you want to use it for at that point. So what you do at that point is um, you um, use a biomaterial, which is renewable. Um, you add it together with agro waste to your product as a packaging. And a good thing about this material uh, specifically is that if you break it down, if you throw it in your garden, it takes about three days and it's gone as nutrition for your soil. soil. There's nothing else in there rather than um, hay and, um, and mushrooms basically. Uh, maybe some coffee to make it grow faster. Um, another example is uh, smartphones, electronic devices. Uh, a lot of rare earth materials are found in there, but most of the times if a company launches the newest brand of iPhone, for example, or Samsung or whatever it is, uh, we discard our old one and we try to find our new one. Um, so what happens there is a very linear consumption model where we take the next phone and we discard card to the previous one. So another strategy you can use in circular economy, and that's really what it's about, it's about applying different strategies to your model, is designing for repair. For example, this is the Fairphone, um, which became famous because it looked mostly at how fair the materials were sourced that you used. But one of the things that they do from a um, circular economy point of view, which I find very interesting, is um, they released a new Fairphone called Fairphone 2 with a better camera. So instead of um, forcing everybody to buy the new Fairphone, what they did is they made it modular. So you can uh, easily take apart your old phone, take the old camera out, take the new one in, you can send the old one back to them and they will make sure it's recycled in a good way. And that most of the materials can get reused in their or other uh, products. So what you do there is you give your users, basically empower them to repair and maintain their own product and trying to minimize as much as possible the waste and the outfall of your product. Um, just to say, these are some examples of ways you can go from this linear economy towards a circular economy where you close the loop in different ways. Um, just a sort of a, a quick sort of introduction to what circular economy entails and why I think the circular economy is a design challenge rather than a purely material challenge. Um, now, this is um, a part I'm, I'm very excited about and I might also go in a rant on this. Um, the thing is with design, design is a, a very unknown thing for most people. Um, there are a lot of unknown unknowns in circular economy and the thing with design is design deals with unknown unknowns. That's what the realm of design and creativity is. We create possibilities and see which of these possibilities, which of these scenarios are most relevant for the situation we're in. Um, so again, I, um, I might go in a rant on this part. Um, so I would like to apologize for that beforehand. Um, I'm extremely passionate about design. I think design is a superpower that we have as people and that we should really, really, um, uh, it's really precious. And 
it's not just about what design is, it's what I mean with design because design has about 50 million different definitions. So I'm just going to use mine on this one. And for me, design, and I talk about design, I talk about the process of design. The design process is a way of working with challenges with a lot of unknown unknowns. I think that's basically it. Um, unknown unknowns are the unknowns you don't yet know that you don't know. So what we do, for example, in science, a lot of times is we have uh, known unknowns. We know what we don't know yet, and then we go to find out what that looks like. We, we set up experiments to define our known unknowns. Um, it's the moment that we encounter unknown unknowns that a lot of scientists panic um, because then you've stumbled upon something new and this was unexpected and that was not foreseen in your theory. That's what we do with, um, with design is we basically force experiments to do exactly that. Um, so in um, the double diamond model that we often use in design, we have two big phases. The first one is designing the right thing. And it's basically every time that you've got a design brief, the first thing that you do is uh, rip the brief apart. Um, if your client knows what he needs, um, it's no longer a design challenge. It's a project management challenge. So the first thing that you do is you look for what really should be the thing that you should be the, the, um, researching, what you really should be designing. And after you've defined the concept and the approach and what you're going to do with it, the next step is designing the things right. And so for me, the first half, designing the right thing, this is the design part. The other one is project management. Project management is extremely important. It's 99% of my job, but it's not really design. It's timekeeping, it's budget keeping, it's um, keeping track of all the partners in your project. It's extremely important to create an output, but it's not the design part of a design project. And so, as I said before, for me, design is a superpower. A superpower because truly understanding and mastering the, the design process is, I think, um, <clears throat> what shapes us as a human species. So this is one of these rent moments. Um, I, I really believe in the concept of ontological design. Ontological design is this idea that we as a society are actively designed by the products that we design. So everybody uses uh, specific designs, spe read specific books, uh, taps into specific stories. And because you use these products, because you read these stories, um, you look at the world from a specific point of view. And looking in from that point of view, the, um, the thing that you start doing is you start seeing opportunities based on the things that you use. So the things we design, design our worldview. And because we see the world in a specific way, we see new opportunities. And that's an extremely powerful thing to do because as a designer, if you start doing that on a conscious level, you can start shaping the way people look at the world and look at the opportunities that um, are in this world. So design gives you a specific lens, uh, a focus and a point of view from which you can observe reality. But it also means that um, design guides um, the opportunities and the challenges that you see. So we are actively being designed by that which we have designed our products our stories the buildings the tools that we use and because we are conditioned by the designed content that we consume we all perceive reality differently and we engage differently with this um with this reality creating more content so um everybody makes everybody designs that's what we do as a species um and i think the the um, important thing is that the moment you start doing that consciously, the moment you start making interactions, making products, services, whatever it is you do, the moment you start doing it consciously, that's the moment that you become a designer. Um, and I think an important part of this is this idea that we have of inventors and inventing. Uh, a lot of times when we look at, at designers, we think about inventing and I think inventing doesn't exist. What we do is you look at something, um, for example, if you look at the invention of the wheel, um, what probably happened is somebody saw a tree fall down and roll down a hill and then figured if I make this tree a bit smaller, that might be easier to carry. And then someone else saw that they could put um, branches on that and carry stuff with them and make it roll around. And all of a sudden you've got a car running around. It's all just building upon what you see and doing next steps with it. Um, and I think what's interesting there is um, in the end, what design is or what design does is design is 
looking at a challenge and how you're going to approach it. How are you going to um, approach a specific challenge so that you can see new opportunities? And because you see these new opportunities, all of a sudden this new world of possibilities goes open and all of a sudden stuff is possible. Stuff that you thought was not possible is doable. And from a theoretical point of view, what you do there, what we normally do when we interact with our products and our environment is we have a specific outcome that we are happy or not happy with. And then we look at um, strategies, techniques, the products that we use, how can we change them? How can we tweak them a bit? And we update what we have and what we know. That's our basic uh, modus operandi that we use. And what you try to do in, in um, design is you try to go from single loop learning to double loop learning, basically not looking at what we do, but why we do that. So you look at the assumptions that were at the base of the products that you created. So for example, if you look at circular economy, if you look at materials, you don't just look at the plastic and try to optimize the plastic because the problem was not the plastic. The problem was the assumptions that you had, why you needed this plastic in the first place. What is the product you made? Why is that product owned by this person who can't dispose of it properly? And you look at the entire system that you created around the product and around the materials that you allocated in that product. Um, there's one point that I um, am also very passionate about is this idea of built environment versus natural environment. We live in this idea that there's a built world and the natural world, and they sort of have to coexist with each other. And well, in my opinion, um, well, we're in the Anthropocene and if there's uh, plastics to be found in the deepest trenches of the ocean, there's no such thing as a natural environment. We have impacted every place on this planet, we as a human being. So that means there's only conscious and unconscious design. Um, I don't believe people want to see the world burn. I don't believe people want to actively uh, destroy what we have. I think a lot of people are just not aware of what our actions result into. And the moment that you start designing and creating and interacting consciously with your environment, that's the moment when stuff starts changing. So uh, bringing it back to the circular economy, this idea of closing loops in various levels. Um, this is a quote by one of my favorite uh, MCs called Scroobius Pip. You see a mouse trap, I see free cheese in a fucking challenge. Basically meaning um, if materials are waste and we uh, assume that waste is basically materials at the wrong time, at the wrong place, in the wrong hands, then we just have to redesign our system in a way that that no longer happens. If it can be broken, then it can be fixed, right? So we've created this tool called the loop tool that has uh, nine categories. I'm not going to, do, going to go into it in too much detail, but we have these nine categories that we think are really crucial in shaping um, circular economy systems, which is rethinking materials, looking at your product design, smart production, the distribution, use phase collecting, pricing models, partnerships, and a sort of overarching idea of mindsets. Um, rethinking materials. Um, one of the ideas you could do is upcycling waste streams. This is uh, the example of Econil. Econil collects um, fishing nets from the ocean and then turn them into new nylon yarn that you can use to build products. Um, so what they do is they uh, look as specifically at ghost fishing, so nets floating around the ocean. This is perfectly good usable nylon that is in the wrong place at the wrong time. So how can we take this out of the sea, make it something good, and then the moment we sell it, make sure that we sell it in a closed way, that the products that we create by it will be collected afterwards and will be reused or at least disposed correctly. Um, another one, if you look at uh, product redesign, I was talking about shoes earlier. This is the Adidas Futurecraft, which is basically a shoe made out of a mono material. Um, as Seema said before, you can use plastics in various ways. You can use polymers in various ways, depending on the uh, production process you use, depending on um, how you're going to, uh, in the end, use them. And so what Adidas did is they created this shoe um, built with different production technologies, but all with the same material, meaning that if you put it in a shredder, basically the, um, the non-chemical recycling part, um, you get the same kind of molecules that you can start reusing again in different ways. Um, Extremis, which is a Belgian design agency, was looking at um, how they could start designing products without waste. So these are, uh, for example, picnic tables built out of one sheet 
of metal um, cut in a way that there's no waste. It's basically just the shape of the sheet um, transformed into the bench. Same goes for uh, Honest Jeans, uh, another Belgian startup uh, working on jeans. And in their pattern design, they made sure that they minimized the waste during their production um, to the bare minimum. And what they have of waste, they recycle again and they make new yarn out of it and uh, make new jeans out of it. Um, from a distribution point of view, you can also look at changing from a product to a service offering, meaning that some people don't need a washer, they just need clean clothing. Um, and servicizing your model can really shift your business model around and make sure that you, for example, Miele has washing machines that don't really wear out. But the moment they start selling those, they um, sell themselves out of the market. So what they started offering is machines that you can lease and you can just buy the clean clothing. You can buy a, a time you let the machine run. And they are right now sort of expanding this from washing machines to drying, to doing your dishes, to um, setting coffee. Um, all these kind of products can also be uh, leased and used as a service rather than you own them. Another one in the use phase, I think Patagonia is very much uh, uh, known in this, in this realm, is uh, offering platforms for sharing and redistribution. Um, Patagonia launched their Better Than New shops, which are basically repair stores for Patagonia. Um, if you buy a secondhand jacket or bag or whatever of Patagonia, you can always have it uh, repaired by them and it will always be cheaper than if you would buy something new. Um, and that's a pledge that they made is that you can always prolong the overall use time of their product. Collecting um, programs, for example, this is Bolt King, which is a, a razor company. Uh, basically what this is, well, you don't have to throw away your old blades from your razor. You can just send them back to us. We can reuse them directly in our, in our own product. So, what they created is this sort of subscription model where you keep sending back your old knives and they send you the new ones. Uh, for them, it's an upside because they know that you will remain part of their sort of business. But at the same time, from a materials point of view, they can really very easily redistribute their, um, their blades and reuse them as well. Another one, again, rent and lease kind of idea is Jared Street. Jared Street sells um, uh, headphones. And these headphones you can take apart completely and you can buy the spare parts. You can very easily upgrade something, change something, uh, depending on what you need or what you want to do. And then um, from the, the, the last ones, we have pricing models. I think there's a lot of certified partners that you can work together with. Um, basically, accountability and credibility is extremely important in sustainability. So not um, inventing your own um, your own uh, certifications, but uh, working with certified partners is a good way to do. Um, and then there's the mindsets. There's a lot of mindsets that can support your sustainability cause, but one of them I think that is getting a lot of traction is animal friendly and vegan. And animal friendly goes way beyond uh, whether or not we should kill animals. It's also, for example, if you look at ocean plastics and uh, ghost fishing, that's also a, a way of looking at animal friendliness um, from another point of view. So what now to, uh, to close up? I think there's three things from a design point of view when looking at sustainability, when looking at circular economy that are crucial. Um, the first one is focusing on designing a context rather than content. Um, what I mean with that, this is an example of uh, a bridge they were planning to build in uh, Antwerp, a city where I live close by. Um, basically they have uh, the, the roundabout, the ringway going around Antwerp that wasn't closed yet. So to close it, they had to build a bridge and they wanted to build a bridge over a place where a lot of people lived. Um, now you can imagine most people weren't too happy with that idea. Um, so what was suggested is what if um, at some point we could move our highways underground and we could use the old uh, ringway to build a, gi a gigantic park around the city. So what you have when you normally look at your challenges is you um, have content design. Basically what you do is you look at your SS situation and you try to improve it, make it a little bit better, do a little bit less bad than you were doing before. And what we should try to move towards is context design. First envision a should be um, goal and then seeing if, if that's the end goal, then what can we create today to make that happen? And that's basically where from a um, entrepreneurial design point of view, we really should be looking at 
it's no longer about just optimizing, incrementally optimizing what we have right now. It's about where do we want to go and then what, what do we need for that? And content design is very static. You start from what you have and you end with the same thing, but a bit different. Context design is very fluid, meaning that everything that you make will change what your end goal is. There's no such thing as an end goal in sustainability in circular economy. It's a moving target. Um, second one, we're in this together. We often talk about the struggle for survival when we talk about entrepreneurship, when we talk about our species, whatever. Um, but most study um, on, on uh, evolution show it's more about the snuggle for survival. It's more about working together. Um, we didn't domesticate the dogs and the dogs didn't domesticate us. We basically found each other and found out there was a, an interesting synergy that we could work on. And the same goes for uh, business ecosystem, for working together between academics, uh, between governments, um, research centers, uh, entrepreneurs, teaming up and seeing how we can tackle with all the knowledge that we have, tackle it together rather than trying to do it on your own. This thing is too big to tackle on your own. And then the, the last one is scaling on impact. Um, which is to say circular economy means looking at the entire value chain of a model. And there's a lot of ins and outs to each and every single um, knowledge field to each and every um, business model. So what you should try to do is the next big thing will probably be a lot of small things. It's not about being um, sort of the big overall one size fits all solution. It's about being one piece of the puzzle and acknowledging the limitations of your own solution and teaming up with the other solutions and making sure that we can create again this network of different kind of solutions that work together depending on their context thank you very much <laughs>